Thank you for joining this evening. Um, I um, I'm not sure if I've met any of you in clinic before, but um, I appreciate you being here and I'm happy to talk with you tonight and answer any questions you may have about um, the topics I'm covering. So I'm going to share my screen um, for my slide set um, and then I will get started. Okay, so um, as uh, Rachel said, um, I'm a physician assistant and I um, mostly specialize at this point in cancer survivorship. I've been working in medical oncology and cancer survivorship for over nine years now with Compass. And um, I just have a real passion for helping patients um, specifically with um, the recovery piece of cancer therapy, which um, has um, traditionally not been a focus in oncology, but that's what cancer survivorship is about. It's actually an international program to help with um, patients' needs as they're recovering from cancer treatment and adjusting into um, moving beyond cancer treatment and living um, as a cancer survivor. So um, tonight's topics I'm gonna to talk about are some of the common issues I address with patients in clinic. Um, when I meet them in a survivorship visit, um, the topics as managing common long-term effects from treatment. So long-term effects from treatment are those types of symptoms that develop during treatment or um, shortly after treatment. Um, and so um, the ones I wanna focus on today, as Rachel said, are neuropathy, cognitive dysfunction, and sexual dysfunction. So chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy refers to the injury and inflammation of um, what we call the peripheral nerve fibers. And these are the nerve fibers that extend um, down to the fingers. Um, so up from the neck down to the fingers. So it affects those nerve endings in the fingers and the hands, as well as the other long nerve fibers that go from our back all the way down to our feet. So we call it a stocking and glove effect where we see the neuropathy develop in the hands and the feet. Um, it uh, is most common in breast cancer um, treatment with what we call taxane chemotherapies, um, which are paclitaxel, um, also known as taxol, and docetaxel, also known as taxotere. Um, those are the ones we utilize in breast cancer treatment pretty regularly and um, are uh, the most significant cause for neuropathy in the breast cancer patients. Um, these drugs do cause injury and inflammation um, that is oftentimes reversible, um, but uh, it can take up to two years for nerves to recover. Most often that recovery um, happens within six to 12 months post-treatment, but sometimes up to two years and sometimes patients are left with some chronic issues beyond that. Um, the most common symptoms we see are numbness and tingling. And then a lot of patients will tell me, like, especially on the bottom of the feet, there's just this weird feeling that's kind of hard to describe, but some patients say it's like walking on sand or feeling like there's a scrunched up sock um, in their shoe, even though they may not be wearing socks or shoes for that matter. Um, because of the loss of sensation in the bottom of the feet, there can be balance issues where you're just feeling like you're struggling with tripping on things, um, especially like changing from a rug surface or carpet surface to a hard surface and vice versa, changes in levels like steps, things like that. You may be tripping a little bit more easily. Um, we can also see um, neuropathic pain develop in patients as the neuropathy develops. And it's uh, typically a sharp shooting type of pain that can come and go. Some people describe it as an aching type pain that's more constant. It could be um, stabbing, it could be burning. Um, those are typical descriptions of neuropathic pain for patients. And even an intolerance to cold or heat or just a general feeling like my feet and my hands feel cold, like they're frozen, but they're not. Um, when you touch them, they're still warm to touch, but um, they feel to you um, very uh, cold. Um, like I mentioned, can potentially be chronic, but for many, it does resolve with time. Um, I also mentioned up here, it can result in a loss of motor and sensory function. One of the functional issues I can see with patients um, outside of the balance issues is in the hands, especially those fingertips. If you think about when you're trying to button your shirt um, or put on an earring back or your bra or um, uh, even just writing or typing or turning a page, 
this can become challenging for patients because of that loss of sensation. Um, and even some patients notice like they're dropping plates, like they're unloading the dishwasher or they're holding a cup or a bottle of water and all of a sudden it slips out from under them. Um, those are some symptoms we can see in relation to that loss of sensation too. Um, so management of neuropathy. Um, so neuropathy is a um, typically progressive issue. It's something that we see that, ac that accumulation of damage over time, if you have it. And so for some patients that may not even um, pronounce itself until you know, you've finished chemotherapy. And I've, had, I've seen that happen with patients where they're going through treatment, they're, they're fine. And then they have their final treatment and then a few weeks later, they start to notice neuropathy symptoms or they've been developing neuropathy. It starts to progress through treatment. And then when they're done, it may even worsen um, for a couple of the months after treatment. So it is something that initially may worsen before you start to get improvement because it's an accumulated effect and damage on that tissue. And it is something that is pretty significant to where sometimes we even have to modify the treatment or even stop the treatment because of the neuropathy. Um, so some therapies to consider. Unfortunately, um, we have not found any therapies that can be um, beneficial in the prevention of neuropathy all that successfully. So a lot of our management is in the after effects. Um, one recommendation I have for um, a lot of patients is to utilize topical menthol cream. And this is just something you buy over the counter at the store. Some people even tell me they've already tried like vapor rub, which is topical menthol too. Um, and I recommend massaging it into the feet and the hands if they bother you too, just don't touch your eyes afterwards or anything. Um, but that massage piece of it is also part of the management because you may see in the supportive therapy category over here, that I also mentioned massage, and there have been some small studies on the benefit of therapeutic massage on a regular basis, helping to reduce um, those bothersome symptoms from neuropathy. So combining the topical menthol, especially at night, that tends to be when patients notice the symptoms are most bothersome, but you know, just massaging it into the feet. Um, another thing I didn't mention on this uh, thing um, on the tables here, but something I also bring up with patients in clinic is there's not really any studies to validate this, um, but it's really not going to harm you to try. But even doing like an Epsom salt soak, um, definitely test the water, make sure it's not scalding hot since you're going to lose temperature sensation with neuropathy too. Um, but doing a little bit of an Epsom salt soak and then applying the topical menthol when your feet are still a little bit damp after that. But Epsom salt is um, something that helps with inflammation and can be soothing for patients. Um, some supplements, um, a lot of patients are interested in supplement use. Um, the two that I consider recommendations for are um, B complex for sure. Um, our B vitamins are important for our nerve health. And um, as your nerves are recovering from the damage and inflammation, they need those B vitamins to help with that regeneration and repair. And so you, taking a B complex vitamin can help with that recovery. And even sometimes patients notice it helps symptomatically. Um, alpha lipoic acid, this um, has been utilized most notably in like diabetic neuropathy, which is a very similar um, development in neuropathy. And uh, it um, is an antioxidant, it's in our foods, but taking it in supplement form in a little bit higher doses than what we would get in our diet can help with lowering the inflammation, the damage and helping with that repair process. Some other supportive therapies to think about. So if you are experiencing the um, balance issues that I mentioned earlier, I will often refer patients to physical therapy to help with that balance piece and avoid falls and tripping and injury. Occupational therapy is a referral all place for patients that are really bothered by those hand symptoms I mentioned especially um, the patients that usually want to go for that hand therapy or when you notice it's um, impairing your ability to work, like if you need to type, turn pages, um, or if you, know, you have um, sewing that you need to do either for your job or your hobby that you want to crochet or um, do general sewing, you know, whatever activity that it may be really bothersome, that's where a hand therapist can really help with those functional issues with the hands. Um, acupuncture, there's been a number of studies 
Um, they've done it during treatment and post-treatment. They found that it seems to be more effective post-treatment, not really effective during. Um, so uh, this is meeting with an acupuncturist and getting consistent acupuncture um, on uh, in the clinical trials. It was at least a weekly basis um, for a number of weeks, but some patients do really find it beneficial. And there are some acupuncturists that also do what's called electroacupuncture, which is applying a little bit of an electrical stimulation which um, may be similar along the lines of um, also on this list, the TENS unit. Um, a TENS unit is a um, transdermal electrical nerve stimulation unit that um, you can have prescribed to you for things like back pain, other muscle injury. And uh, it is also something that can be considered for um, benefiting neuropathy discomfort. And that's what electroacupuncture is also potentially providing. Um, there are other strategies, um, integrative strategies like mindfulness uh, meditation and yoga have been studied with some benefit, just general regular exercise may be helpful. And then cognitive behavioral therapy, this is a type of psychotherapy that uh, you work with is a psychotherapist that um, is trained in this type of psychotherapy and they, it helps you with um, coping with um, the symptoms, but also with uh, part of the mindfulness and, and mental association with those symptoms. Now, sometimes patients have really severe um, bothersome symptoms to where we may offer a prescription therapy. Most often, um, this is going to be when there's a pain um, associated with the neuropathy because the uh, pain seems to be more responsive to medication therapies um, than the general sensation issues. But some patients are really bothered by those sensation issues, and we can um, try these prescription therapies with some benefit too. So the one we typically start with is gabapentin, also known as Neurontin. Um, this is a drug that uh, can be titrated up as needed. And oftentimes it's recommended that if you get to the maximal benefit of that and you don't have um, as much benefit as you're hoping for, um, you can move on to an additional medication or switch. Um, duloxetine, um, which is also known as Cymbalta, this is recommended as an option for painful neuropathy. It has proven itself in randomized clinical trials to be beneficial for chemotherapy-induced painful neuropathy. Um, pregabalin is also known as Lyrica. This is another drug that some patients find helpful for general neuropathy symptoms. Sometimes we may prescribe opioids and um, we do try to avoid that, things like narcotics, um, Vicodin, um, oxycodone as such, um, but uh, this is an option if we've exhausted other efforts. Topical lidocaine is something we can also prescribe that you can put locally to areas like um, on the feet uh, if they're bothering you. And um, then compounded creams, these are creams that are prescription, um, but are purchased at a compounding pharmacy. And they often um, have a couple of different drugs in them that are topical, that are anesthetics um, and anti-inflammatants and um, analgesics. And um, typically they aren't really covered by insurance very well and can be costly when you're using them on a regular basis. Uh, so I don't um, prescribe them too often unless um, someone is able to afford them. All right. Um, next up, cognitive dysfunction. So uh, this is also known as chemo brain. Um, we call it chemo brain, but uh, it can also be um, an effect from surgery, radiation, and the common endocrine therapies that we give women um, for breast cancer, like tamoxifen and the aromatase inhibitor family, um, as well as just even uh, menopause in general. And so uh, if we've given you treatment that has caused you to go into menopause, you may notice cognitive dysfunction as well. Um, and there's even some possibility that the biologic effects from cancer cancer um, uh, may be affecting cognition too in terms of its inflammatory effects in the brain tissue. Um, there are studies where patients indicate cognitive dysfunction even prior to the onset of treatment. Um, the most common symptoms we see with this include short-term memory and recall. Um, definitely, I see that very regularly. Short-term memory being like walked into the room, no idea why I walked in here, or I you know, can't remember where I put my keys. Um, the word recall can be really frustrating and embarrassing for people, especially conversationally, if you're talking and you just can't remember a word, um, or you see your neighbor at the store and 
for the life of you, you just can't remember their name. So that can be really frustrating for people. Um, attention can be affected where you find that reading a book is really challenging or just focusing on a task. You just are all over the place. Um, and then also processing. So it may be uh, taking you longer um, and a little bit more challenging to understand things uh, that otherwise wouldn't be so um, challenging for you or just learning new information just is seeming to be a little bit more challenging. Um, for most patients, this does improve on average six to 12 months, um, but uh, there can be some chronic effects um, and it is completely individual depending on other factors that may be involved. Um, and those other factors can include fatigue, which is also a very common side effect of treatment. I'm not speaking to that today in particular, but it's probably one of the most common side effects of cancer therapies. And um, it does cause a um, just systemic fatigue that can affect your cognition as well. And oftentimes as fatigue improves, so does cognitive dysfunction. Sleep disturbance. Um, so sleep disturbance, also a common side effect to cancer therapies. Um, and I think most of us recognize that if we've had a poor night's sleep, we don't really feel like the sharpest tool in the shed the next day. So um, regular sleep is something that is important for our cognitive health. Vitamin, mineral deficiencies, metabolic disturbances. This um, is such, things such as like B12 deficiency, iron deficiency, um, disruption of like potassium, calcium, uh, magnesium, um, and metabolic disturbances like thyroid dysfunction, um, diabetes. Uh, these can also contribute to cognitive um, disabilities. Pain, um, if you have chronic pain issues, um, and especially in needing chronic pain medication, uh, that can affect your cognition. Other medications that are well known to cause cognitive difficulties are what we call anxiolytics. So things like Xanax, Ativan, Lorazepam um, type medications when utilized regularly may start to affect cognition. Um, emotional distress. Uh, if you're having issues with depression, troubles coping with depression or anxiety, uh, this um, can cause cognitive issues and uh, just general cognitive reserve, what you're starting with, um, as well as age. We tend to have a declining cognitive reserve with age and your general health status. These are also fa factors in um, how much you're affected by the chemotherapy or other cancer therapies. So interventions. Um, regular exercise. This uh, is probably one of the first recommendations we have. There are studies uh, showing that cognitive testing is significantly improved when patients undergo regular physical exercise programs. Um, this is most studied in patients with dementia or ADHD, which have similar symptom um, issues that uh, the chemotherapy can cause. Um, so a regular exercise program uh, may help with not only just the cognitive issues, but also fatigue. Um, some just strategies to help you with managing the symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're able to try to reserve your more cognitively demanding tasks at a time of day when your energy is highest, which is typically earlier on in the day. The end of the day is oftentimes really not beneficial for energy or cognition um, for most patients. And so if you're able to reserve those things that you really need to focus on and give your full attention to um, uh, in process, do that earlier on in the day. And then also um, just make sure you set up a, a kind of safety net for yourself. So reminder notes, if you're someone that just didn't have to write things down before, just do it for yourself right now and eliminate that frustration and, and irritation you get with yourself if you do forget something. So reminder notes, post-it notes on your bathroom mirror, your door before you walk out, sometimes even posting one on your, um, your driver's wheel before you are headed out for work. Um, even writing down the night before things that you want to make sure you remember for the next day, just do that on a notepad before you go to bed. Make sure you have a centralized calendar, something that you're putting all the uh, dates you want to remember um, all in one place. Don't have it scattered. Staying organized is also very important. Make sure your important documents like tax documents, bills, that stuff, have a home. Um, they, that way you know where to look for them easily. And then um, other strategies you can do at home, cognitive training. So just basic puzzles and games. Like if you are struggling with short-term memory and word recall, doing games that help with that, like words with friends, um, doing uh, crossword puzzles, 
uh, other memory type fun games you can play with yourself or friends um, or family and um, other things like, you know, short term memory you call like basic memory game uh, that you can do with kids where you have to remember which tile you flipped over and where the other one was that matched it. Just fun stuff like that can really start to bring back a lot of that connection and speed um, with your memory. And then you can also utilize online resources and apps. There's lumosity.com, brainhq.com. There's a ton of different apps out there too. If you just search for cognitive games, um, things that you can just do, you know, on your downtime when you're waiting in line at the store or, um, you know, waiting for your water to boil for dinner or something, just something to just keep up that activity. Um, now, uh, there are studies um, showing that cognitive behavioral therapy, which I mentioned, can be beneficial for neuropathy, also can be beneficial for coping with and managing the symptoms of um, cognitive dysfunction relaxation, meditation, yoga, again, these things can be beneficial interventions. Um, and then uh, more intensive interventions uh, can be something called cognitive rehabilitation, where you go and see a specialist to help with um, working on more in-depth specialized strategies for your specific deficits. So occupational therapists, speech therapists, they do an evaluation and give you those specific tools um, to work on to help in those areas that you're struggling. Neuro neuropsychological evaluation, this is where you see someone that's a neuropsychologist um, will often refer patients to these specialists when someone is um, having such significant issues that they may be considering disability related to it. This is rare, um, but it is something that we may need to refer some patients to or those that may um, be struggling as they get back into work and we need a little bit more validation and um, uh, to help with any kind of work limitations they may be having. Um, something I don't have on here, but is also an option as a step up therapy is prescription options. Um, there are some therapies that we can try for patients. And I will say the most oftentimes that I've given these are, again, if it's affecting your ability to, to go back to work and do your job um, uh, adequately, some patients do go on stimulant type medications, um, things like Adderall, um, modafinil is a psychostimulant that can help with fatigue as well well as cognition and has shown some benefit in studies in breast cancer survivors. So these are things typically where you've gone through some of those additional testing um, modalities um, that I mentioned above, and then it may consider um, more specialized medication treatment if needed. All right, third topic tonight, last but not least by any means is sexual dysfunction. Um, very much so an under-addressed issue for many survivors. Um, I, working in cancer survivorship, I have the opportunity to be able to spend a lot of time with patients and discussion and management as they're recovering from cancer treatment and um, topics like sexual dysfunction or things that don't um, easily come up in their general medical oncology visits with their oncologist. So I spend a lot of time with patients in this topic and um, the cancer therapies for breast cancer uh, can really be disruptive in your sexual function. A lot of times because we are affecting your hormone function, um, most breast cancers are hormone driven. And so we want to block out estrogen and progesterone's effects. And when we do that, we affect um, sexual function um, in a number of ways also surgery, coping with um, body image changes after surgery, sensation changes after surgery, and some women that um, go on to have like their ovaries removed for hormonal reasons or mutation issues, um, that adds another element. Um, other contributing factors like psychosocial issues, mental health issues, which are common um, as you're recovering from cancer treatment or going through cancer treatment. So any kind of emotional distress, depression, anxiety, Certain medications may affect sexual function, um, as well as just your other general health. If you're a smoker, if you have diabetes, significant cardiovascular disease, this will also factor into your sexual function. Um, so the most common issues we see in breast cancer survivors, um, vaginal dryness, very common, uh, low libido, so low sexual drive um, or just no desire for sex decreased sensation, um, struggling with orgasm, uh, dealing with the changes in your body image, as well as communicating with your partner. 
So vaginal dryness, probably one of the more common issues because um, with those hormonal effects we tend to do on women, tamoxifen aromatase inhibitors or um, going into menopause uh, because of treatment, uh, vaginal dryness is a consequence of menopause in general. And then we can aggravate that for women with these treatments. So um, one thing that I start with with pretty much most patients is moisturize. Um, vaginal dryness is a consequence of the lack of estrogen to the vaginal tissue. Estrogen helps keep the vaginal tissue nice and um, supple, helps with natural lubrication, um, helps reduce uh, infection issues and incontinence. So when we lose that estrogen, we start to have those issues, dryness, itching, inflammation, urinary incontinence, even infections, vaginal infections or any tract infections. Vaginal moisturizers are non-hormonal, um, based products. And these are over the counter products. They are meant for maintenance use. You get your most bang for your buck when you are using these consistently for weeks and then just maintenance long-term. So when patients start using them, I remind them, look, it's going to be at least four to six weeks before you really start to notice the benefit. And then you need to continue. For maintenance use, you utilize them three days a week. Um, moisturizers, just like you think when you're moisturizing your skin, like if your hands are chapped, it takes more than one application to get that chapping to go away, right? It takes that consistent use. You don't have to use the vaginal moisturizers multiple times a day, but you do wanna use them at least three days a week. If you have more severe dryness initially, maybe it's five to seven days a week, and then you back off to three days a week for maintenance use. But studies show um, that women that utilize vaginal moisturizers regularly had um, just as much benefit sometimes, even, even more benefit than a topical estrogen therapy. Um, not all women, but definitely um, there were women that really gained a lot of benefit from use. The products that I recommend are hyaluronic acid-based ones. Those are the ones that did perform well in studies. So you can see down here, Hyalo GYN, Reverie, um, those are hyaluronic acid-based products. Just Google search them. They're um, usually purchased online. They come in suppositories, which you place intravaginally or a gel, um, which is applied with an applicator. The gel gives the added benefit of being able to place externally if you have some irritation externally as well. Um, and Vagisan cream is a lipid containing product. Um, it's more widely available, I think in the UK, but I have seen it on Amazon as well. And a side note, these are over the counter. They can be pricey. Um, one thought with that um, to help with some of the cost, um, if some of you out there have a health savings account or a like copay assistance card that helps you pay for things over the counter, um, like for Tylenol, sunscreen, that type of stuff, because this is a menopausal issue, um, oftentimes you can use those types of copay cards to help pay for this kind of over-the-counter thing, just as you would for buying Tylenol or sunscreen, um, just as a side note there. Um, next, lubrication. Most people have heard about lubrication. This is what you apply just before intercourse, during intercourse as needed. Um, there are three main types. There's silicone-based, there's water-based, and there's oil-based. Silicone based do tend to be the most slippery and longer lasting. Um, oil based ones, some people just use what they got around home, right? Olive oil, coconut oil, or a vitamin E capsule that you prick open. Just a side note about the oil based ones one, they're pretty messy and they can stain sheets, a little bit harder to clean up, um, but they can also break down latex condoms. So if you are using latex condoms, you would want to avoid oil based products just to make sure that the integrity of the condoms are not is not compromised. Um, also vaginal stimulation, just stimulating the tissue and the nerves down there will help with improving blood flow sensation and natural lubrication. So that can be through self-stimulation that can be using like a vibrator, um, maybe start with a very light vibration setting, um, using other types of sexual toys that are enjoyable for you with lubricants. Um, and that can just help to just stimulate the tissue and the natural response to stimulation down there. Um, I did put in here Mona Lisa Touch, um, which is a fractionated CO2 laser. Um, it is uh, approved for use for dermal um, uses, uh, but not currently, to my knowledge, approved um, for um, breast cancer patients with menopausal issues. It is also nothing, uh, it is also not 
covered by insurance. So this is an out-of-pocket cost thing that you would have to consider. It can cost several thousand dollars and does um, require application at least a couple times. But um, small studies do show that it helps to improve um, generation of new collagen, um, improvement in elastin and vascularization of the tissue and uh, significant improvement in dryness, um, stimulation, sexual function, even incontinence. Um, if you're interested in this, you could talk with your gynecologist. Uh, they may um, be offering this or they may be able to guide you and someone in the community that is trained um, in use of this. But I have had a number of patients over the years that went and had this done and found it really beneficial. Um, but it's just not something that's currently utilized very frequently, um, but just another option out there. Topical hormones. So um, in general, if you've had breast cancer, we don't want to be giving your body hormones, um, estrogen, progesterone, because most cancers, most breast cancers are driven by those hormones. But um, topical estrogen applied to the vaginal tissue and external area in low doses has been studied and is considered safe for use in breast cancer survivors. So it is something we do prescribe. It is especially helpful for incontinence and frequent urinary tract infections, as well as dryness. So I often recommend let's try some of these other things, especially the moisturizers, um, get a good lubricant, try the stimulation. If those things are not helping with the dryness, um, that's where you could move to the topical hormone. And that's something that your medical oncologist can prescribe for you. Additional interventions. So um, these are more geared towards pain with intercourse. Pain with intercourse can be related to dryness, um, but it can be related to other issues too, oftentimes pelvic floor dysfunction. And there um, are specialized physical therapists that work in pelvic floor therapy and studies show improvement in sexual pain, arousal, even just lubrication and your orgasm and just general satisfaction with sex can be improved when going through a pelvic floor physical therapy program. And that's something that uh, your provider can refer you to, or I refer patients to when I see them in survivorship visits. Integrative therapies have also been studied like yoga, meditation, and again, cognitive behavioral therapy kind of coming up <laughs> in the picture. Um, they are studying that uh, in sexual function too. And it's just a way of helping to cope with the side effects and having a little bit more understanding of um, our responses. Uh, to these issues. Um, topical lidocaine, there's a small study carried out in breast cancer survivors that those that were experiencing pain with intercourse, um, applying um, topical lidocaine to the vulvar vestibule, which is just outside the entrance to the vagina, um, notice significant improvement in their pain. Um, so that is also something that would be prescribed by your provider. Um, Improving desire, so sexual drive, libido, um, very commonly affected by cancer therapies. Oftentimes, it can just be related to the fact that sex hasn't been enjoyable because it's painful because of dryness or other reasons and working on that pain piece will help with improving desire if it feels better then you may want to do it. Um, but sometimes it's also affected by a number of other factors. Uh, sexual function is um, often tied to many other health factors for us. And um, especially anything going on emotionally um, may affect uh, women in particular, their sexual function. And so any kind of emotional distress going on, you would want to um, get a management of as a piece of and helping to improve sexual function to um, fatigue from treatment. You know, when you're tired at the end of the day, the last thing that you may feel like doing is trying to have sex with your partner or even self-stimulation. And so trying, if you can, scheduling it for other times of the day can be helpful. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you're not having sex regularly, sometimes it's just not on your radar. And so uh, it's, trying to bring back some of that stimulation and thoughts, um, such as thinking about sexual fantasies, writing them down, reading an erotic book, watching a movie, talking about sexual fantasies um, and things with your partner, um, working on genital stimulation, like I mentioned, just kind of a reawakening um, the feelings down there. Um, and then be sure that if you are with a partner, sometimes if sex is not happening, um, 
sometimes we lose that other intimacy with our partner and that can further uh, lessen our desire. And so make sure that if this is happening, consider, okay, um, maybe let's try bringing back some physical touch, like hand holding, hugging, giving a big long hug at the start of the day or the end of the day. Um, make sure that you're laughing together, just enjoying each other's company. Even if it's just watching a Netflix show, that's funny to both of you, you both enjoy. That's something you're spending together and enjoying each other's company with, or plan a date night or date day, um, just an outing that's enjoyable for the two of you, um, you know, having a kiss, hello, a kiss, good night, um, just having some of that physical closeness and engaging in just that general closeness and enjoyment with each other um, when sexual intimacy may not be happening. And then consider counseling. Um, this can be for individualized therapy um, or couples therapy if there's a lot of communication just, um, uh, difficulties and sex therapy. There are qualified sex therapists that can work with individuals and couples, and um, they can help with navigating um, communication around sex, as well as helping to improve desire and other tools and strategies beyond what I mentioned today. And um, uh, if you work with an oncology clinic, there's often social workers that can help with finding therapists in the community. Um, I know at Compass Oncology, I refer to our um, social workers to help with patients um, interested in finding therapists in the community that are qualified and um, knowledgeable and cancer survivors. Um, and that is it. Um, so hopefully that information was helpful to you. Um, I'll open the floor to any questions anyone may have about some of the material I talked about or 